There's a city, and the city is full of people who are sinful. What does that mean? Well, to sin is an archery term. It means to miss the mark. So these are people who aren't oriented properly. And so the city is in a chaotic state. And God tells Jonah that he's going to go to that city and tell them just exactly what's up with them. And Jonah thinks, no, I'm not going to do that. And why? Well, that doesn't require much explanation. It's like, how popular are you going to be if you go to a city full of chaotic people and tell them, why they're stupid and wrong. It's, Jonah thinks, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't care if God's telling me to do it. So his conscience is telling him to do it, or his destiny is telling him to do it, or, or his orientation with higher morality is telling him to do it. You can read it any way you want. And so he thinks, no, I'm hopping on this boat, and I'm getting as far away from that city as I possibly can. And so he does that, and then the storm comes up, because God thinks, no, you're not getting away. If I told you to do something, you're not getting away from it. A storm comes up. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's easy. Betray your destiny and see how long it takes you to be drowning in a storm. It'll happen immediately, and, and of course it will, because what, what's calling you to be your best is exactly the thing that's pushing you forward to manifest yourself most fully in the world. It's what you need. You run away from that, the boat's going to start to rock very, very quickly. Well, and you all know that. You, per, you know that perfectly well. It, it, it's, hell, all you have to do is not study for an exam that you know that's coming up to see everything start to, the storm waters start to rise and everything start to rock. It's pretty bloody obvious. So anyways, he's on this boat and there's a storm. And all of the people on the boat who, who can't quite discriminate chaos from weather because they haven't differentiated the world to that degree, think, oh, the boat wouldn't be about to be swamped if we hadn't, some of us hadn't done something stupid and wrong. And there's logic in that. You know, you might think, well, God has nothing personal against you because of the storm, so you're confusing levels of analysis. But you've got to give these people some credit. It's like, maybe they did do something stupid. Maybe they didn't caulk the damn boat properly. Maybe the ropes aren't in as good a shape as they might be. Maybe they weren't paying attention to the weather when they went out on the ocean, you know? Or maybe they haven't made peace with their brother and so their hearts are bent and twisted out of shape so they don't make particularly good sailors. It's like the idea that you encounter a storm because you're stupid and wrong is a really good idea, even though it's not of infinite applicability. Anyways, they draw lots. It's a primitive thing to do. It's like, well, it's, one, it's someone's fault. We don't know who. We're going to throw someone overboard, the worst sinner. Obviously, that's what God wants, some kind of sacrifice. So they all draw lots, and someone loses. And then Jonah stands up and says, well, sorry, guys. Like, I know that I've got a problem with God at the moment, so it's probably me. You better throw me over. And they don't really want to, but he finally convinces them. Over he goes, and the storm settles. Well, you know, Sometimes if you're in a group of people in an organization, there is someone in the organization whose head isn't screwed on exactly straight. And they know exactly why it is and what they've done wrong and what puts them in that position. And they are poisoning the entire enterprise. And if you throw them overboard or better, if they agree voluntarily to leave, then the storm will abate and everything will be okay. So anyways, they throw jo Job over, or Jonah overboard, and a whale comes up and swallows him and takes him down to the bottom of the ocean. Well, we already know what that means, because we watched Pinocchio. It's like, when God abandons you, because you've abandoned your destiny, and the storms come up, the probability that you're going to be taken down to the, to the depths is extraordinarily high, and that happens in people's lives all the time. Well, so down there, Jonah repents. Well, what do you do when you're in the underworld? You've been there before, when things fall apart on you, your friends have abandoned you, you're not as popular as you could be, you can't stand to look at yourself in the mirror. Into the underworld you go, and you think, geez, I've done a lot of things wrong, you know? Maybe I should reconcile myself with the world, and I could get out of this. Well, so that's what Jonah does. He thinks, all right, I've got this destiny. I better go do what God says. So the whale spits him out onto the beach, and off he goes to the city to tell them what's wrong. Well. That's what that represents. That's these symbols, you know. It's so cool. This second one, I really, I really like. It's so interesting because you see Jonah re-emerging from the whale and he's got a halo around his head. You say, well, what's a halo? Well, have you ever looked at a quarter? Well, think about a quarter. 
The quarter's the moon. And who's on the quarter? The queen. The queen is surrounded by the halo of the moon. The queen's queen of the, queen of the night. Gold coin, that's the king's head on the sun. That's the halo. Well, what comes out of the belly of the, of the fish? It's the illuminated human being. It's the spirit of the illuminated human being. Well, that's what that means. Well, how, what does that mean? Well, what else would come out of chaos? You know, if you, if you fall apart and then you put yourself back together, what is it that comes back out? Well, at least you're in better shape than you were before, you know, and, and then maybe you do that 20 times in your life or 50 times and you do it voluntarily. Every time you do it, you're more like the thing with the halo and less like the thing that's, you know, being thrown overboard by your friends. And the Midianites sold Joseph into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So now he's a slave. So now you'd think, well, that would be, this is a man who has a lot of reason to be irritated at the structure of reality, right? He's gone from being the favorite to being betrayed by all of his brothers. That's pretty rough. And then he's being transformed into a slave, and now he's being, he's being sold to work as a slave. So you'd think that that would corrupt his character. Because, you know, one of the things, I think this is the case anyways, I think people are always looking for an excuse to have their character corrupted. Because if your character is corrupted, then you get to lie, and you get to cheat, and you get to steal, and you get to betray, and you get to act resentfully, and you get to do nothing. And that's all easy. It's easier to lie than to tell the truth. It's easier to do nothing than to do something. So there's always part of you thinking, well, I need a justification for being useless and horrible, because that would be a lot less work. And so then if something terrible comes along, you think, aha, that's just exactly the excuse that I was waiting for. And then out all that comes. You know, Solzhenitsyn, when he was in the concentration camps in Russia, watching how people behaved, you know, he said that there were people that were put in the camps who immediately became trustees or guards, and they were even more vicious than the people who had been hired as guards. And his idea was that they had collected all that, he called it foulness, if I remember correctly, around them in normal life. But they didn't have the opportunity to express it. But as soon as you gave them the opportunity, it was like, there it was, right away. And so, so one of the messages that seems to echo through these Old Testament stories is that just because something terrible happens to you doesn't mean that you get to be, that you get to wander off the path and make things worse. And maybe it doesn't matter how terrible it is that what happens to you. And that's a tough call, you know, because you see people now and then in life who they've really got it rough, man. Like 50 bad things are happening to them at the same time. And you think, oh, it's no wonder. If you were bitter and resentful and hostile, it'd be like, yeah, no wonder. But then you meet people, and Solzhenitsyn again talked about this in the Gulag Archipelago. He said he met lots of people in the, not lots, he met enough people to impress him in the concentration camp system who didn't allow their misfortunes to corrupt them. And that's something, man. Because maybe the only real misfortune is to become corrupted. That's a really useful thing to think. You know, maybe the rest of it, maybe the rest of it is trivial in comparison. I know that's a rough thing because you can be in very harsh circumstances, but I do think there's something to that. And the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So that's an echo of the idea that we encountered earlier about walking with God, right? So Adam walked with God before he ate the fruit with Eve and then he wouldn't walk with God. And then Noah walked with God and Abraham walked with God. And so the idea is, well, that's that alignment with the highest ideal. I think it's something like that. And you know, we could think about that as a metaphysical claim as well. But I don't think it is. I mean, I've got thousands of letters now in the last year from people who have told me that they were in a pit. That's exactly right. And that they decided that they were going to try to put their lives together. And that it worked. And so that's really something, you know. And they write surprised. It's like, well, I decided that I was going to 
work hard at what I was doing and I wasn't going to lie any more than absolutely necessary. I thought I'd give it a try for a few months, you know. And all sorts of good things started to happen to me. It's like, maybe that's how the world works. Now, obviously, it doesn't work like that all the time, right? Because you can get sliced off at the knees. I mean, there's an arbitrary element to existence that's, that you can't wish away. But that doesn't mean that there are... It doesn't mean that there aren't bad strategies and good strategies. And so, I do think that one of the most fundamental existential questions is, like, if things aren't going well for you in your life is, are you absolutely certain that you're doing absolutely everything you can to put things in order? Because if you're not, then you shouldn't complain. Because you don't know to what degree you're actually contributing or even causing the circumstance. Now, that's a very annoying thing to think, and I'm not trying to blame the victim. You know, I know that people end up with lung cancer because they were exposed to asbestos, you know. I'm, I'm not trying to... Although I also know, too, that if you have lung cancer because you've been exposed to asbestos, that can be a tragedy or it can be hell. And to some degree, that depends on how you conduct yourself. 